All right. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Hope you are doing well. I'm joining you from the sunny beaches of Aruba or from a place that finds me too technically challenged to uh, change my background to what it actually is. I'm joining you from the uh, corporate headquarters of Worthington Industries. Very glad you could join us for our second virtual Columbus Tableau user group. Um, we are very excited for the, uh, the speakers we have today. And just a note on that, we have realized, and we were talking about it before we kicked off this meeting, the, the power that these virtual meetings have in allowing us to, to really go out and get some of the tremendous talent that exists in the Tableau community. So just so in case you're worried that we, we understand this and we were talking about ways as, e as even as, as we begin to evolve back into, you know, what normal used to look like, ways to keep this going, whether it's hybrid meetings where we're meeting in person, pulling folks in from the community virtually. Um, I think it's really opened our eyes to the power um, of connecting with those folks out in the community. So very excited for the opportunity to bring you what we have in store for you today. And uh, we'll go ahead and just for some of you that haven't been to these meetings, to familiarize yourself with the leadership team of the Columbus Tug. I'm Steve Bartos. I have the pleasure of leading the corporate advanced analytics team at Worthington Industries. Matt? I'm not sure that Matt has joined us quite yet, so I'll go ahead and jump in his place. Right. Um, my name yeah, is Erin Ham. I work in, at Nationwide Insurance. I am a consultant for data and analytics and visualization within our finance space and help lead our Nationwide Tableau user group as well as sitting on our BI Center of Excellence board. So next up, Derek. Hey everybody, Derek Shreve here. I'm a local Tableau rep here out of uh, Columbus. I've been at Tableau for five years and support the leaders here with the uh, Columbus Tableau user group. And most recently, and right in front of me right now, is my four-day-year-old child named Vivian. <laughs> but Dr. Bardos refers to her as Vizian, which is pretty clever. <laughs> yeah, for, for a bit, we thought we were actually going to have a, a contest at this tug to name Derek's young child. But I believe Derek's wife balked at that proposal. Well, thank you, Derek. And I'll turn it over to Aaron here in just a second for the introduction. And we do appreciate all the time, energy, and effort of the folks that you know went into putting this together, the speakers, leadership team, folks on the Tableau side to help us coordinate. So thank you, thank you. And uh, with that, Aaron, back over to you. All right, so today we're going to have two key speakers. The first one is going to be Chantilly. Um, she is the Vice President of Data Analytics and Training at Loveletics based in Arlington, Virginia. Prior to joining Loveletics, um, she worked for Johnson & Johnson and Comcast. She is a two-time Zen master who specializes in data visualization, data analytics, design, and training. And then after Chantilly, we have up Mark Jewett. Um, and Mark Jewett is the Vice President of Product Marketing at Tableau. He comes with more than 20 years of technology covering startups to large enterprises. Um, and he spent 15 years at Microsoft as a leader in the SQL Server and Azure Business Units. Um, and so he will be our second speaker talking about what's to come in Tableau. After that, we are going to close out the session with questions and discussion and then any closing remarks that anyone in the audience or our speakers have to discuss. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chantilly. Awesome. Thank you all for, for having me. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here and we'll kick it off. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we're good. Yep. Alrighty, good stuff. Well, welcome everyone. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, today, I would like to talk to you all about redesigning legacy reports using Tableau. And I put this under the, the overall series that I've been doing called Design Secrets for a Non-Designer because some of the, the items that we're gonna walk through today are some of the design secrets that I've created over the years that can um, enable you know, developers as they're, they're going through this process you know, to just create better Tableau reports. Um, with that, I'm Chantilly Jagannath, Vice President of Data Visualization and Training for Lovelytics, and I'm also a, a 2019 and 2020 Tableau Zen Master. 
So let's go ahead and, and, and dive right into it, right? So how many of you have, have um, you know, been in a, a role, or started a new role, and you were tasked with either, you know, recreating previous reports or, or taking a legacy report that might have been done in like Power BI or Excel and then transitioning that to, to Tableau? I know that for a lot of the roles that, that I've been in, both at Comcast, Johnson & Johnson, and even, as Lo, even at Lovelytics as a leader of the data visualization team, there have been plenty of times where clients or users have come to me with some form of a legacy report, and they've been using Tableau for a while, or they're just getting started with Tableau, or they're you know, transitioning over to it, and they're like, hey, we have this report, you know, it's kind of clunky, we want to enhance it, uh, but we don't want our requirements to change too much. Like our users like the metrics that they see here for the most part, but we want a better way of displaying that information to drive like user engagement, things like that. So here's one of the reports that uh, we are going to look at and look at to enhance today. So this is a digital marketing campaign performance dashboard um, that was created by the Tableau team um, and they actually gave me this report um, to enhance. So this was actually something that came through Lovelytics and, and came to myself in particular and they didn't have you know many requirements associated with it in terms of things that they wanted to take away but um, they did just want me to enhance this, this visualization. Um, so let's walk through some of those steps and actually let's first walk through the report itself. So here is that, that dashboard uh, where the top left-hand corner, you can see, you can click on the, vari the various audiences, filter the dashboard. It's a marketing uh, campaign dashboard. So you have a list of each of the campaigns and selecting a campaign will filter the dashboard based on that as well. We have a date range filter here that allows the the end user to choose whatever date range they wish. So if we wanted to look at data for the last three quarters instead of the last five, it would go ahead and update the visualization. Then we have some key marketing metrics. So impressions, click through rate, CTR, uh, cost, the leads, the cost per lead, prime leads, and then cost per prime lead. Then we have a nice text table here that breaks out um, the last three quarters on a quarterly basis and those same key metrics, right? Then we have the same key metrics broken out by a particular channel. And then down below, we have nice trends for all of those metrics. You can hover over and see the metric. And you even have a dual axis for metrics that intersect. And then you also have the ability to adjust the granularity of the, the chart. So you can adjust this to look at it at a daily level, a weekly level, a monthly level, um, or a quarterly level, right? And then to the right of that, you have a KPI pacing chart, which to be honest, I couldn't figure out exactly what this visualization was showing, but it was determined that we did not need to use this visualization on the right hand side uh, when we were enhancing this report, right? So you're given a dashboard or you're given a report, whether it's an old Tableau report or an old Excel report, or maybe it's a, a, business, a, a business intelligence dashboard that you know, your end users are looking to you to enhance and you know gather better requirements and just present something that's way more user friendly in Tableau. So that's what we're going to walk through today. You know how to go from point A to point Z. So the way that I like to think about the design secrets and, and flowing through this process is first I like to gather requirements. Typically, when you're given a legacy report, your requirements are already provided for you. And it's up to you to just have conversations with the end users in terms of things that they like about it or things that they do not like about it. From there, once you've honed in on those requirements, before I even start developing or redeveloping anything in Tableau, I like to create a template first or even several temp templates that aid in the visual process of what the end product is going to look like. From there, once I've built out the views and developed them in Tableau, I've, I've selected a template, I've built it out in Tableau, I've added my charts, I like to use icons and colors to start to enhance it, right? Give it a bit of a visual appeal. And then last but not least, I always make sure that I'm paying, um, uh, you know, particular attention to the fonts that I use in the dashboard. And to be honest with you, fonts, I try not to overcomplicate them um, and just use one font in particular and no more than four font sizes. But today I'm just gonna walk you all through um, some of the underlying requirements that I put into each of these five design secrets when I'm taking a legacy report and then rebuilding it in Tableau. So let's talk about gathering requirements. 
Now, typically when I do the series, I have a, a, a high level topic, which in this case is gathering requirements, and then I have the breakout points for each of them. But instead of going through each of them one by one, because you know that's just another uh, session that I, I typically do, I wanna present you all with those guidelines that I talk to my end users about. So whenever I'm going through any type of dashboard project, I wanna understand the overall goal of the project. I wanna determine the audience's analytical maturity very early on so that I know if I'm creating like a more static dashboard for you know, purposes of a PowerPoint or an image, or if I'm creating a very interactive dashboard that an analyst can go in and explore. Um, I also like to think about end user preferences in terms of colors, logos, and sizing the dashboard. I make sure that I'm refining and prioritizing the business questions. You know, So if a user gives me about 50 different questions, I have to drill those down to maybe a good 10, no more than 12, so that they can fit on the dashboard. I'm completing a high level data discovery to make sure that the requirements align with the data that is available. And then last but not least, I'm making sure that I determine some of the views that are gonna be needed in order to uh, answer these questions that they have. But today we're going to focus on about four of those. We're going to um, hone in on the goal of the project. We're going to determine our audience's analytical maturity. We're going to refine those business questions and determine the views that are going to be needed in order to answer them. So let's dive right in. So if we start to take this dashboard apart and we look at it bit by bit, uh, we want to start to understand what are the requirements or what are some of the things that the users were trying to get at when they had the support, right? So the first thing I see here is that the user wanted the ability to filter the dashboard by a date range and a campaign. And in talking with the team, we noticed that filtering the dashboard by the audiences was not something that we needed to transition to the new dashboard. So as I mentioned before, this is going to be um, uh, a collaborative process between not only yourself, but also the users who might have used the legacy report in the past and also users who are going to use it in the future because you want to make sure that you are honing in on what are the requirements that they want to take out of this dashboard and transition to the new one and what are some things that they can completely scratch like you don't need to see it in the new one. So the first thing here is to still want to have the ability to filter by a date range and a campaign. Next, as we see here for a specific time period, what are the totals for the most important metrics? So first we need us to understand exactly what are the most important metrics. Are we still going to be looking at impressions, click through rates, costs, leads, cost per lead, prime leads, and then cost per prime lead? Or can we start to take some of those metrics out? And in speaking with the end users, they liked all of these metrics, but the one that they did take out was the click through rate. For all of the metrics, what are the values per quarter? So obviously that was something that they wanted to understand too, maybe because they're using this report on a quarterly review level. So having these, these metrics broken out per quarter was important to them for when they have those quarterly review meetings. Next, what are the values per channel um, for, for each of the metrics? So once again, we're going back to those important metrics and now we're just breaking them out even further by all of the, uh, the marketing channels. And then last but not least, what are the trends for each metrics? What are the trends per day, trends per week, and the, the trends per month? So we wanna take those same important metrics and now break them out over time. So here we are taking this old report, refining the requirements, understanding what's important, what we can scratch, and what needs to definitely be in the next report. So once we've done that, the next thing you want to do is start to determine the views that are needed to answer these questions, right? So you don't want to necessarily go off of this old report because if you leave it sometimes to your, your, old, your old users, they may say put everything in a text table. And that's not what we want to do with our new report. We want to enhance it. We want to provide vis better visuals for their requirements. So I always recommend starting from scratch and redetermining the views that are needed in order to answer those questions. So here, if we look at the first requirement, um, for a specific time period, what are the totals of our most important metrics? So the word totals lets me know that we're aggregating numbers at a high level. And the chart type or the view that I think will best suit that is a band or a big aggregated number, right? So we can aggregate these numbers to impressions, costs, leads, cost per lead, prime leads, and then cost per prime lead. Next, what are the values per channel for each metric? The previous dashboard had it broken out in a text table, but if we want to, you know, rank these or sort these or start to understand which channel was 
uh, had the highest uh, value for each of these metrics, a bar chart will probably be the best uh, visual to, to, to help your users identify that insight without them having to, you know, scroll through a text table. So I've gone ahead and selected a bar chart for this. Next, what are the trends for each metric? Um, what are the trends per day, per week, and per month? So in this instance, I do not think that we need to create a chart per day, per week, and per month. Instead, we can use a parameter. But when we think in terms of trends, that's definitely a line chart that's going to help us achieve that. We don't need bars and lines on top of those or dual axis chart. I think having each metric with its own um, you know, chart is probably going to be the best view for this requirement. And then the last one, what are the values for each metric per quarter? Now, I'm not a fan of displaying text tables on a dashboard, but if it's needed, I always say that we can place that within a collapsible container with the show hide feature that um, has recently been introduced into Tableau Desktop. So for this, I said, okay, we can stick with the text table, but we're going to make it collapsible. From there, I always say you never want to dive right into, you know, developing a dashboard. I always recommend creating a template. So when you're creating their, your template, there are several things that you want to think about. You want to prioritize your requirements, only use what's important. You want to select your tool, whether it's blank text boxes in Tableau, pen, or paper, or pen and paper, or other tools that I'm going to show you. You want to make sure that you're selecting your tool that's going to allow you to create your template. When you're creating your template, you want to make sure that you're designing to a grid. As you're building it, you also want to be sure to incorporate those bands because they're really important in providing introductory information to your users before diving into the details. You want to make sure that you're using size and position to show hierarchy and also begin to think about the placement of icons and how you're going to color your dashboard. So the ones that we're going to focus on today are building it out using pen and paper or blank text boxes, designing to a grid, and incorporating bands and adding context. So whenever I create a template, there are several tools that I, you know, sometimes use to do those things. You can do it directly in Tableau, and I'll show you an example of how you can use um, blank text boxes or text boxes with context to start to lay out your dashboard. You can also use Balsamic, which is a wireframing tool, and I believe it's $100 for a license um, to have a desktop license, and it's a little bit cheaper if you have a cloud license. Figma is a free design tool as well. I love to use Figma to create uh, modern dashboards and templates, and I'll show you examples of Figma uh, templates as well. And then Ninja Mock is another one that's really popular. It's on the same level as Balsamic in creating wireframes. I personally don't use it, but I know in the design community, especially in the UI UX community, it's one that is used by a lot of designers. So if you were to use Tableau to build out your your template, you can simply create a new dashboard without having any worksheets on it and use the blank text boxes or text boxes on the left hand side to start to lay out your template. And here are two examples of templates that were created directly in Tableau. Here are two examples of wireframes that are built out in Balsamic. So the difference between building out a template in Tableau and Balsamic is that in Balsamic, you can start to create like charts without actually developing it. So in Tableau, in order to create a chart, you have to develop something, right? You have to place something on columns or on um, rows and start to actually build that out. But we don't want to do that just yet, right? We want to make sure that we're laying everything out before we start the development process. So with Balsamic, um, you can actually start to lay out your, your charts, add in those charts using basic elements like rectangles and boxes and just some of the, the objects that they give you for free. You can use those to create a really nice um, template. And as the, the leader for the visualization team at Lovelytics, Every project that we get for a client, I, I, I don't necessarily have the, the time or the capacity to, you know, um, actually develop those things. I have a team that, that, that uh, develops those things for me. But if, you know, a, a team member of mine is stuck on how to create this dashboard, I typically use Balsamic to create that wireframe and I pass it off to them and they're able to take this wireframe and build it out exactly in Tableau. And then another tool that I use is called Figma. And Figma allows you to create um, really neat wireframes or, or shells, skeletons, templates, whatever you like to call it, uh, with more of a modern design look and feel. But the goal here is that you're just laying out your dashboard or laying out your, your template so that you understand the structure that you need to follow once you transition everything into Tableau. 
So there are several tools of choice. Um, for this one, I'm going to actually be using uh, Figma as well as Balsamic and then transitioning everything over to Tableau. So once you've selected your tool, go ahead and create your wireframe, but keep those requirements in mind as you build out your wireframe or your template. So if I go back to the requirements, we have four main requirements here, looking at aggregated numbers, we're looking at things, uh, we're looking at all of the metrics per channel, we're looking at the trends for each metric over time, um, as well as incorporating the day, the week, and the month filter. And then we're also looking at this same information by quarter, but we're gonna build that into a text table that is gonna be collapsible. So I went ahead and I, I used Balsamic to create three templates. And that's the beauty of you know, wireframing and designing before you start development, right? You can share these wireframes with your end users um, who will be using them and get their feedback. You know, which one do you like more than the other? What should I add? And that takes away you know, from you having to do some rework in the end when you're developing you know, your dashboards because sometimes it might be hard to start to move things around in Tableau or redesign this chart, but wireframe framing and creating the template gives you a baseline before you actually go into the tool and start developing. So here I've created three designs using Balsamic um, and each of them have those requirements laid out. It's just pictured rather differently and I can actually pull up Balsamic here and show them to you. So here's the first design, right, where we're taking each of the metrics, we're providing the band numbers at the top for each of the metrics, and then in the same area, we're also providing the breakout by channel. So each of these bars represents the four channels that were um, in the original report. So these will be the, the impressions per channel, cost per channel, leads per channel, cost per lead per channel, prime leads per channel, and then the cost per prime lead per channel. And then down below, um, I'm allowing the user to interact with the band area up top to filter the, the, the line chart below. So that's why you see here it says met, uh, impressions and it's in the uh, less than or greater than uh, brackets per day. And that's also in less than or greater than brackets because that's just saying that a user can click um, and a value is going to be passed to populate this line chart. So for this one, I'm saying the user selected impressions, the user has selected day, and now we're looking at impressions per day. However, the user can select week, they can select month, and this is going to adjust. And that's the beauty of parameters and parameter actions in Tableau. Absolutely love the feature. And then here we also have the collapsible filter pane that's gonna include our dates as well as our campaigns. And here we have that collapsible table that's going to include the uh, quarters. Here's another view, right? We have the same information. We're just breaking it out a little bit differently, a little bit more interactive here too. On the left-hand side, we have all of the metrics, just the plain metrics listed out. If you wanted to add like some KPI information week over week, month over month, you can do that on the left-hand side as well. But remember, it wasn't a part of our original requirements, so I'm not gonna do it. Um, on the right-hand side, we have the, once again, impressions per day, and this is just stating that the user is going to click on a metric on the left hand side to filter everything on the right hand side. So here we're looking at the line chart broken out by day. We still have the collapsible table, but instead of having the channels with each of the metrics in the same box, we have the channels in its own box and you select the metric to now filter that view. And then the last template takes each of the metrics and it gives them their own line chart as well as its own channel box. So we have six different boxes here. Uh, we have each of the metrics listed again. We have the date adjuster, the date granularity adjuster up top. And this is going to adjust you know, for all of the charts because it's a parameter once you select anything on the, on the button bar. And then you also have the breakout per channel. Right, so here's another view of the same information laid out. And this is so easy to do when you're creating a template. It probably took me maybe 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes to create all three of these. But just imagine it had you, you know, develop this and your user said, oh, I wanna see it a different way. You would now have to like rework a lot of things that you did in Tableau, but this just provides you with a good baseline on um, where to start. And it allows you to, you know, create multiple views, adjust it around without having to um, rearrange it and do that in the development stage. So out of one, two, and three, go ahead and use the chat and tell me which one you like the most. Like if you were the end user for this, which one would you wanna see? 
I'm gonna go to the chat. I wanna see what you all are saying. Three, three, one, two. Okay, wide range. All righty, so let's see what I picked. Drum roll, please. Final selection was Dashboard one, so design one is the one that I actually ended up going with. Um, so we have the metrics up top, we have the channels broken out for each of these, and then we have the interaction where you select the metric and it will filter the chart down below. So I ended up going with dash with um, version one, but you know, any of those versions in my eyes were, were, were really good to go with, but I ended up going with the first one, just personal preference. But if it were my end user or my client and they decided on three, I would definitely do three or two instead of one. All righty, so I went ahead and I took this wireframe that you see here. And because I was creating more of a modern dashboard, I used Figma to create the shell, the shell of the template. So I used Figma to build out these boxes that you see here, which represent the metrics, the six metrics up top. And then I used another box to represent the line chart down below. So that's what you see here, right? So I created this using Figma. Um, it's an image, it's actually a dashboard image that I then brought into Tableau and I'll show you exactly how I did that in a second. So I went from Balsamic to Figma and now we're gonna go from Figma to Tableau. So fill in your template by creating the views gathered in the requirements section. So remember, once again, we had all of our requirements laid out. We selected the views that are gonna best represent them. And now you wanna create those in Tableau, right? You don't have to use color or think about all of those things when you're developing it, but keep it in mind, right? We're gonna dive deeper into colors, icons, and font. Just keep those things in mind as you build out your views. So let's go ahead and transition to Tableau. So the beauty of building out a template in either Tableau itself, Figma or Balsamic is that they are designed to scale. And by that, I mean, when I transition back to Balsamic, if you see the, the uh, rectangle in the background, the size of that is 1100 by 927. And when I say design to scale is if you wanted to design this pixel by pixel within Tableau, you can replicate it exactly as it is in Figma. So you can size your dashboard in Tableau 1100 by 927 and you won't have to just you won't have to guess or rearrange exactly how things should be sized. When you do it in the wireframe, the beauty of some of these tools is that it replicates or it trans translates very easily over to Tableau. But if you build your template already in Tableau, you kind of know exactly what those measurements are going to be. But just know that if you do it in Balsamic or if you do it in Figma, those same um, coordinates, the width and the height, do translate over to Tableau very well. So I went ahead and exported the image in, in Tableau, I mean, in Figma, and I brought it in as a uh, image in the background in, in Tableau, right? So this image was downloaded. This entire thing is one image. If I take it away, it's one image, right? It's in the background. I went ahead and added um, the, the title myself and our logo in the, in the uh, bottom right-hand corner. So you bring in your, your template, right? Regardless of if you built it in Figma or you start to lay it out in Tableau and then you fill it in, right? So here I have um, filled in the template by creating each of the worksheets that are needed for this. So we have each of the metrics and their bands. We have each of the channels broken out for the metrics. And then we also have the parameter here which right now is just set to impressions per day. But if I were to show the parameter, is it this one? There it is. You see that it is um, transitioning between metric to metric to show you the metric over time. And then I've also gone ahead and, and built in the, uh, the parameter buttons to navigate between the various date granularities. All right, so we're building our views and we brought them in. I went ahead and also brought in the collapsible text table that you see here that's showing the same information by, um, by channel per quarter. All right, so we did that. Now, once you fill in your template, you build in your views, 
the next thing you want to do is you want to start to add a bit of flair to it, right? So you gathered your requirements, you built your template, you filled in your template with your views. And typically, I'll also add when I'm building my views, I use very neutral colors because I decide color more towards the end, right? I design and I use color very strategically in my dashboard. So notice here, when I built out each of my worksheets, they're all neutral colors. Everything is gray for the most part because I use color where color is is needed and not just having color everywhere so i always design a grayscale first for the most part so next we want to go to icons let's talk about how to strategically add icons to your dashboard right so here are my icons and art guidelines you want to make sure that you're selecting icons that communicate meaning and are easy to recognize the example that i typically give is a house icon if you see a house icon on your dashboard your users can recognize that house icon with uh, you know going back to the home page right going back to the main page it's a icon that resonates very easily with a lot of people they understand that icon you don't want to have an icon on your dashboard that your users have to think about next when you're uh, including icons you want to make sure that you include a label and or provide context Typically, when I add icons to my dashboard, I add them into the band area, right? And when you include a band on your dashboard, it already has a label. You're not just going to put a number on there and don't say what that number represents. So if it's sales, you'll say sales. If it's customers, you'll say customers. And typically, if I add an icon to the band area, the band label already provides the context for the, uh, the icon. However, if you are adding icons anywhere else on your dashboard and you want your users to have some form of interaction with it, be sure to provide context or just some additional information in terms of what they should do with it. If it's a home icon, just don't put it on your dashboard and assume that they know to click on that to go back to the home page. If it's your logo, don't just assume that they know to click on your logo to go to your company page. Or if it's an information icon, don't just assume all, all the time that they know to click on that information icon to view more info. Always provide context and add a label. When you're selecting labels, you wanna make sure that you're not getting too you know, creative with them and you don't have a lot of graphic details associated with it. And graphic details are the lines um, and the, 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 the curves and the points that you see associated with an icon. This icon has a lot of graphic details associated with it, but that's okay because it's large. Typically, you're not placing large icons on your dashboards. So the smaller those icons get, the harder they are to see. So make sure that you're using icons that um, don't have too much graphic detail associated with them and are simple. Next, when you're selecting icons and you're using multiple icons on your dashboard, you want to keep your, your styles consistent and cohesive. Meaning, if you're, if you're using solid icons, make sure all of your icons are solid, like if they're in the same area. If it's in another area of the report, it's okay if those icons that are grouped together are silhouette icons. But just make sure that icons that are related to each other are in the same like relational space have the same consistency associated with it, have very similar colors, um, are all solid or all silhouette, things like that. Next, uh, make sure that you're using icons that go with your dashboard theme, right? So if your dashboard theme or your colors are, or your brand colors are gonna be like red, white, and black, don't just have like a random purple icon on your dashboard just because it looks pretty like purple and, and red look pretty together to you like don't do that just make sure that you're using icons that go with your overall theme because as i mentioned icons add to the visual appeal of your dashboard the true message should be in your charts and in the details not in your icons so don't use them to distract but to enhance all righty so if we go back to the um if we go back here, right? Remember I said I typically add icons to um, the band area of my charts, right? So I'm not gonna add icons everywhere, you know, on this dashboard. I'm gonna be very strategic with where I place them. So if I think about where I would add icons to add like a pop of flair, I think the top right-hand corner, a very small icon can go for each of these bands and add a pop of flair to it, right? So what that would look like is this. So here I've added very small icons to the top right corner of each of my metrics that go along with the metric with the metric name. So impressions are like views. So that's why you see the I cost is money leads are, you know, interactions between you and someone like they're they're probably 
going to turn in, turn into like a, a client. Um, so we're using icons that resonate hopefully pretty easy with the with the end user prime prime leads or like your star leads and that's why a uh, cost per lead or is a star um, with the dollar sign associated with it so just remember you're, you're picking icons minimal graphic detail very consistent so they're all solid icons for the most part they're not silhouette icons very small just adding um a bit of flair to the to the dashboard and not too much and not taking away from the overall message Next, once you add your icons, right, you want to um, add color, right? So you can either do color first and then icons because sometimes you might want to color your icons based off of the color that you selected for your dashboard. But either way, color and icon can be changed around interchangeably. So when you're selecting colors for your dashboards, right, you want to first uh, let your brand colors form the basis. So if you're creating this for a client or if you're creating it for your organization, you wanna allow your brand colors to form the basis of your dashboard. If you're stuck on colors, you can go ahead and, and use like Pinterest or Tableau Public or one of these um, visualization sites to get inspiration. When I do this talk and I go through the, the design secrets, I give tons of examples where a lot of the work that I've created over the years was because of, I, was, I found something online that inspired me and I used it as a basis to create my final visualization. When you're selecting colors, you also want to make sure that you are not using more than two dominant colors. When I say dominant colors, those are like bold colors, colors that aren't like your neutral grays or your whites, right? So I say gray and white, light gray and white are more neutral colors. Anything else is more of a dominant or a bolder color. Anything like orange, red, purple, pink, uh, like black or really dark gray and navy blue, those are considered dominant colors. And you don't want to use more than two of those in your visualization. You also want to make sure that you're using accessible color schemes and testing them. Just because you can see a dashboard does not mean that your end users can see it the same way that you see it. So you want to make sure that you are testing them um, for like red weak and red, red blind color deficiencies and making sure that if you use color to highlight anything or differentiate between maybe good or bad, that your end users can tell what's the good and what's the bad based on the color that you have there. You also want to make sure that you're using purpose, color purposefully and for reinforcement. Don't just have color on a chart just because, right? You know, just because we want to, you know, um, you know, it looks it looks plain. So let's have color to it. Like why, right? Why are we using color on this chart? What is what is uh, the what is the the purpose that color is serving on this chart? Is it going to bring attention to something for our end users, right? Think about that when you're coloring your charts. And if stuck, always go ahead and design in grayscale first and add color strategically to highlight. And in this case, I went ahead and I designed in grayscale first. And now we're going to talk about how to add color strategically. So if I go back here, right, and we look at this view, where would we start to, to add colors at? So I typically start um, top to bottom, left to right, because that's how your users read the dashboard. I think having the title is great, is fine. We don't need to change that. If I look here, I see the impressions, the band number is gray. I think that's fine. I think if I were to add color to anything, because these channels are sorted alphabetically per, um, per metric, where I would wanna add color to would probably be the, the channel and metric intersection that is the highest. So I would add color here to highlight really quickly that impressions um, is the highest for the program channel, right? For here, paid social is the highest for cost. And yes, the length of the bar does, you know, give that same insight, but adding color to it strategically is gonna make sure that your user's eyes are, are, are drawn there. So that's probably where I would add color to. I would maybe think about adding color to um, signify like a max or a min point here, but because I'm doing a dual axis already with an area chart and a line chart to give it that, that nice look and feel, I'm not gonna add color to this line chart. So if we add color to it, I'm just gonna do it for these sections. And the last thing that it's going to look like is this. So I went ahead and I added color to my metric sections up top and I allowed the user to easily pick up on 
uh, which channel was the highest for the metrics. And now that I've added color, you can easily see that program or paid and paid social are the highest for um, each of the metrics. And to wrap it all up, I went ahead and if I go to my font guidelines, I went ahead and made sure that I was using one legible font in the entire dashboard. And the best way that you can do that when you're in Tableau is to format your dashboard or format your workbook and format the entire workbook with one font. I use this all the time. Just to make sure that you don't have any worksheets on your dashboard that have different fonts, this is probably the safest way to make sure that all of your information on your dashboard and in your workbook has the exact same font. So I think that is very important when you're selecting fonts for your dashboard. Stick to one legible font. Also say, use no more than four sizes of that font type. Try to avoid custom fonts if possible, because when you publish a custom font to Tableau Online or Tableau Public, if that font is not available on those servers, then Tableau is going to adjust it to one that is, and they're going to adjust it to Tableau Book. So if you had a really narrow font um, that you were, you were, you were hoping to, to go for, Tableau Book is a wider font, so you're going to notice that everything um, with that font that you publish up is going to now adjust. So make sure you're avoiding custom fonts if possible. If you are using colored fonts um, and colored backgrounds, you want to make sure you're also test, uh, testing those for contrast accessibility. So according to the web content accessibility guidelines, there's a specific ratio uh, between a background color and text color that allows users to see the information that is being displayed. In this dashboard, I wanted to make sure that the lighter gray, if I were to use a lighter gray for these titles, that you know someone that might have a contrast a deficiency could still see that gray on that white background. So be sure to test your font colors accordingly as well, especially if you're using um, lighter tones on a lighter background or darker uh, text colors on a darker uh, dashboard background. Be sure to also emphasize or use color and or bold your text to emphasize anything you want your users eyes to be drawn to. So by this, I mean, if you have a paragraph on your dashboard that has like a description of everything and it's more than say two sentences, never assume that your end users are gonna read it because if I'm your end, your, your end user, I'm probably not gonna read anything more than, than two sentences on your dashboard. However, to be on the safe side, go ahead and bold and or use color within that paragraph or that body of text to make sure that your user's eyes are drawn to bits and pieces of it. So if I look at a paragraph, that I've already decided I'm not going to read, you know, in its entirety. If you highlight things, my eyes are going to be drawn to it and I can pick up on the bits and pieces. And instead of just ignoring your paragraph, you know, altogether, I can now just see certain things and like, oh, okay, maybe I will go back and, and see this says uh, this data is from the year 2019. Oh, maybe I, I can see like what employees is looking at, things like that. And then last but not least, uh, make sure that if you have large bodies of text on your dashboard, you are aligning your fonts left because it's the easiest for your, your users to digest and you're staying away from center and right alignment for large bodies of text because your users have to read like out and in and out and in the beginning and the break of those lines aren't the same. So it's always harder for your end users to read. So those are the font guidelines. And in this dashboard, as I mentioned before, I use four font sizes, uh, which I typically break out between uh, chart headers. So all the headers are the same, bands, also labels for each of these are the same, as well as the uh, chart headers here. And then if I go back to the PowerPoint, and review the uh, the final dashboard with you all. The last thing that I did here was I built in that interactivity to allow the users to click on each of these boxes and it adjusts the chart at the bottom. So instead of having a drop down, I went ahead and for those of you are, who are wondering how I did that, each of these boxes um, have their own worksheet. It has a particular measure name associated with it and the measure value that's associated with it. And I use the if I go back here, parameter actions based off of measure names and measure values. I have two dashboards with the same source in here. So that's why I said it's, it's uh, it can't be done like this, but um, you can see that it's obviously working. But I use per, uh, measure names and measure values um, as a way of passing whatever measurement is on this uh, this worksheet right here. I'm using that to pass the same measurement 
through a parameter to what is being displayed on this line chart. So parameter and, and parameter actions using measure names and measure values is what allowed me to uh, get this uh, chart down here. And then, as I mentioned before, we have the text table that is here. Right, so we don't have to take up a lot of real estate with that text table. We have our filters that's available up here and all of this is using um, horizontal and vertical collapsible containers within Tableau. If you drag one on here, right, there's an option that says add show hide button and you can just place your content within this container and then you can assign the show hide button for it. So once again, drag it on here to drag uh, information into a floating container like this hold shift right hold hold shift and then you can drag it on there so if i wanted to place this in that container i'm holding shift and i can drop it in there all right and then to get this to be a collapsible container you go ahead and select that button tableau automatically populates a button there for you and you can edit the look and feel of that button which is what i did here i just went ahead and chose an image that was a filter instead of the the x so that's how you do that for those of you who are wondering. And it's the same way that I did this one. So an X versus a grid. So let's go ahead and wrap this thing up. So if we go back to our original requirements, we now have our new dashboard and let's make sure that our new dashboard hones in on those requirements from our legacy reports, as well as any new requirements that our end users were looking for. So the ability to filter the dashboard by a date range and a campaign can now be done with this collapsible container in the top right hand corner. We have for a specific time period, what are the totals for most of the important metrics? Our important metrics being impressions, cost, leads, cost per lead, prime leads, cost per prime lead. So we went ahead and narrowed down what our important metrics were. Next, what are the values per channel for each metric? So we've done that nicely with these bar charts here. We've added a splash of color so that the user can easily see which um, channel and metric were the highest, right? So impressions, we have program costs, we have paid social leads, we have paid social. So we've added color so that users can quickly identify that within the first 30 seconds of looking at this dashboard. Next, what are the values for each metric per quarter? We went ahead and did that with what? We did that with the collapsible container. So if they were using this in a quarterly report, they could go ahead and expand it, take a nice image of it and present it to their leadership team, or they can expand it and collapse it, you know, as they, as they best see fit if it was on online. And then the last thing, what are the trends um, for, for each metric? We wanna view those trends on a, a daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly level. And we went ahead and took care of that with the parameter that you see here, day, week, and month, a user can uh, adjust that and change it. I'll just make sure that I showed you all that here. You can adjust that. And once again, that is using parameter actions as well. Um, I don't know why I did that, but going back here. All right, in summary, when you are, you know, redesigning your reports, you know, start with those requirements from the original report, enhance those, have a collaborative discussion, get a lot of feedback from your original owners of that report, as well as the new stakeholders for that report. Everything does not have to be in the new report, enhance it, better it, right? Go ahead and build your template and add your views. Once you, you have those requirements, use either Tableau, Balsamic, or Figma. Balsamic also has a free 30-day trial if you wanna you know, get a good feel of the tool without paying for it. So build your template first, provide your end users with what the end result will look like, get their opinion on it. That way that you can take away some time from the development stage and making sure you understand all of their requirements in the design phase before you actually develop. Then once you've built your views, incorporate design elements that are going to enhance your story. Don't just add stuff just to, to, to add it and take away from the overall message. Make sure you're adding it strategically and enhance your story. And last but not least, add color strategically, icons for charm, and be sure to only select one legible font. And with that, I am Chantilly Jagannath. Um, if you're interested in getting in contact with me or the Lovelytics team for any of the services that we um that we offer. Uh, here's my contact information. And if you are interested in learning more about creating some of these modern design dashboards or just dashboards in general and walking through uh, more examples and use cases of what I call the design secrets, go ahead and check out my blog, www.designsecretsforanondesigner.com, where I host videos, um, weekly, sometimes bi-weekly webinars, and I publish all of the recordings to the blogs. 
All righty, I will uh, now turn it back over to you all. Thank you, Chantilly. Um, so we do have a couple questions in the chat that we want to go ahead and ask now, and then we'll save the rest for the 415 discussion time. So okay. The first one is, would you say it's okay to stay in the same font family, or would you say it's more important to stick to a single font? I, I think it's best to stay to a, a, a simple, a, a single font. Um, can you show how to fit data from a sheet to small panel in a dashboard? To uh, uh, can expand on that to a, a panel. Uh, so I think that might just mean to like fit within. So in your template, you have like the squares or the panels per se, and like how you fit the data exactly in there. Oh, these like this, these. Yeah. Oh, so I perfectly align everything. So if the, I usually don't do floating dashboards for if they're professional dashboards, but if they are, I use the X and the Y axis to make sure I am aligning everything perfectly. So here, everything is aligned or close to aligned with the X, the Y axis of 137. This one is also 137. So you can type it in and adjust it if it's off, but, but that's typically how I, uh, how I do that. Perfect. And then the last question we have is, in terms of legacy reports conversion, were there reports that didn't fit in Tableau, for example, cross-tab reports with large amounts of columns or PDF slash printout reports? Uh, absolutely. And what I typically um, do for those, and I can just show really quick, uh, typically for reports that have large amounts of text, Right, or if it requires large, you know, uh, reports, sometimes I'll have, uh, I'll add in some navigation and I'll have like a tabular report here. And this entire thing will be a, a tabular, a tabular report that's similar to something like this, right? So I have it in there. I just don't make it the presence of it, right? You want to make sure you're asking your end users, what are you getting out of this, this looking at this table? And try to find a better way to visualize that. If they're looking to see which column was the highest or the lowest, go ahead and transition that to a bar chart so that they can quickly see that. Nine times out of 10, your user is scanning that table for something. Find out what that something is and visualize it better. Perfect. And then we did have a, one question surrounding the icons that we did answer. And so that one is, what are some resources for icons? Um, so icons8.com, the noun project icon, and flaticon.com are all great resources for icons. Are there any additional that you would recommend? Uh, no, I use a uh, flat icon for pretty much everything because you can change the color of them. And it's also free. The noun project, I think you have to pay for it. And icons8, I think you have to pay for it as well. Yep. Perfect. So with that, we are going to transition to Mark Jewett. Thank you so much, Chantilly, for your presentation. It was wonderful. Um, so next up, we have the Vice President of Product Marketing. So Mark leads the Product Partner and Community Marketing at Tableau. Um, so and he's going to be talking about the upcoming features and what's new to come in Tableau. So turn it over to Mark. Can you can I confirm you can hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Aaron, for the introduction. Chantilly, you're amazing. I was uh, excited that I got to join a little early. My, I had a meeting cancel and I got to see uh, a whole bunch of your presentation, which is always a, a joy. Uh, and I learn a ton. So uh, amazing work, like always. That was really awesome. Um, and now I have to try and follow that. So thanks a lot. That, that's, what, that's what I have to say to that. Uh, so as, uh, as Aaron said, uh, I'm Mark Jewett. Uh, I'm uh, part of the Tableau team. And uh, I've been at Tableau for about three years. Uh, it's been just an incredible time uh, for many different reasons. And one of my favorite things to do is to uh, talk and present and be a part of user groups. Uh, but part of the reason for that is because I get to actually see people in person a lot of the times and this stinks. So I'm just going to recognize that it's a bold new world out there and uh, I will try and keep my energy up and keep us flying through. I think I have Aaron about 15 or 20 minutes. Is that, is that the right target? That is correct. Great. Uh, and I'm just going to focus a little bit on uh, what's to come in Tableau. And uh, by the way, that's my Twitter handle down at the bottom there. Feel free to use that. I'd love to stay in touch. Um, so I always like to start these with a very exciting slide that my lawyers make me put in. So I get to make a joke here and say, I can't predict the future. Base your stuff on what's in the market today and not what's coming. 
But fortunately, despite the lawyers, we have not changed our tune. We are here to help people see and understand data. We wake up every single day and we think about that. And uh, it, it has driven us for more than 15 years now. Um, and it's never been more relevant, um, it, it, the, uh, especially in, in a world where there's a lot of external factors that impact the analysis that we're trying to do. You know, public health data and government data and economic indicators and all these things outside of our organizations are having a huge influence on the analysis that we need to be able to do. And so um, we're going to keep at it is our, our main message here. Uh, there's, I, I always do like to sort of focus on some of the things that we've done uh, over the last 12 months. Um, for people that have been using Tableau for more than a, a year or two, uh, you'll know that Tableau used to release on a much less frequent basis um, than, uh, than we do now. We release every quarter now and it keeps us on our toes. But one of the dynamics that we've, we've noticed, even when we talk to Zen masters like Chantilly, is it's hard to keep up with. Uh, I, I've heard that a number of times, and so things that you know that we announced back into last year in the last 12 months, um, oftentimes you know as I'm I'm speaking with folks like you, it's like oh gosh I didn't even know that was there. And so as I talk about the future, I never want to miss the opportunity to talk about the very recent past, um, and you can kind of get our uh, a sense of our of our product strategy and our focus areas. I, I picked out a few. The last 12 months and these four releases uh, have, have represented more than 200 you know, uh, individual features. Um, but you can kind of get a sense of where we're going to continue to focus even by looking at you know, some of these features. So in, in, in analytics, you know, you've seen a focus on interactivity right, with animations and set control and, and uh, some of the parameter actions that Chantilly was showing. And so that's been a focus area for us. Uh, expanding the capabilities for being able to cater to more traditional types of presentation of, of data or reporting. Being able to do PDF subscriptions and export to PowerPoint and even just expanded table support. Um, has been another area for us. Uh, geo, spatial has been a big area. Buffer calcs and spatial uh, calculations and, and uh, uh, thing, you know, replacing the maps uh, in Tableau. Uh, augmented analytics, things that we still fundamentally believe in the power of people that hasn't changed. Um, but we have realized that there are things that we can do to present people with more of the story and what the algorithm might tell us, like with explained data, behind the reasons for why something looks the way it does. Uh, and we find people's judgment is important in that. We present several different options. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, the, the capability to let the computer do some work is very much in our, in our focus. Um, of course, uh, metrics was released, great for mobile in particular. Um, dynamic parameters, a hugely requested feature uh, over a course of time. So that's been some of the work that we've done in, in analytics. Uh, a second area for us is data management. This was really born in listening to all of you uh, and the amount of time that goes into getting data, you know, uh, being able to connect to it, being able to get it in the shape that it needs to be for great analysis. Um, really being able to transform it. And, uh, and so, you know, we've released several things. We continue to, to drive pretty hard on prep, uh, Tableau prep, both builder and conductor. Uh, we, it, we continue to expand the number of connectors and actually we've, we've come out with a way where third parties can start to build their own connectors for Tableau. So we're, we're uh, making that more extensible to keep being able to connect to more sources of data. Uh, catalog, the ability to um, you know, really help people discover and learn more about the data and provide administrators with a better opportunity to curate it. Uh, and then something that I'm gonna talk about more in just a minute, which is relationships uh, and, and really the way the data model works inside of Tableau. And then a whole bunch of enterprise and developer features as well. And I, you know, I won't go through every one of those, but just you know, a lot of progress over the last 12 months 
But I want to spend a minute here talking about relationships and just make sure that it's clear that, um, you know, people's eyes don't sort of roll back in their head when you start talking about data modeling, um, that, that, it, that it's actually clear what we've done here. And it's a feature we just released, essentially. It represents a really fundamental underlying change to how Tableau uh, handles data. Uh, and so I'm going to fly through a few slides that's just a quick story tell on what relationships are effectively doing. And then I want to show you what that means in Tableau. So let me dance through that really quick. Um, okay, so this, this is a, a very simplistic typical data model that you might deal with, that you might find in your, in your database. Oops, apparently that goes forward without me. Um, and so, you know, and it's effectively a store, a convenience store, and it's relating products and transactions and customers. And what Tableau does today, or up until uh, recently, it merges, uh, it normalizes, my goodness, this is just going to navigate without me here. Um, if I was smart, I would turn off the navigation, but I'm going to try and do this. So uh, Tableau would normalize the model. Uh, and what would happen is things uh, would disappear that, that because of the join model, right? And uh, if there was data missing in the columns, that would disappear as well because of the default joins that happen. And so uh, as well, when you did aggregations, they would not be right because it would be adding or summing the values. Of course, we launched level of detail expressions to handle that, but not everybody writes level of detail expressions. Uh, and so um, that was the way we solved it before. Relationships help us solve that in a much more automated uh, way. So if you take that data model and you connect with something that we call the noodle, which is creating a relationship, uh, it will smartly aggregate that data uh, and it will create the contextual joins. So Jeez, this, uh, this is out of control. This thing is just flipping without me. Hold on, let me get rid of all of my, uh, <laughs> my slide transitions. Um, okay. All right, so what I'm, I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna flip over to Tableau uh, and I'm gonna show you how this works. Uh, so this is a, a super simple data model. It's got the, the tabs at the bottom here. Uh, somebody please wave your hands if you can't see what I'm showing. It might be a little bit small. Um, I hope you can see it well enough. So the, the data model here is just the what we looked at. Customers, transactions, transaction details, obviously very short uh, on the, the line items here, just to sort of prove the point. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump into Tableau and I'm gonna show you side by side uh, the way this was handled previous to relationships and how it gets handled in relationships. I'm using 2020.2 here. So 2020.2 still supports the, the, the classical model that you're used to. Uh, I do want to emphasize that we didn't change this underneath you, but it added the capability to do relationships. What you're looking at here is the relationship. All I did is dr drug those tables in right and it is doing the joins on the tables uh, smartly kind of joining on the different fields. And then in this version on the right side over here, you can see it looks a little different. It has these squiggly lines, what we call the noodles. That's reinforcing the relationships. If you know the data model or the data source page well, you might be noticing some differences here. Uh, this is just showing the data from the transaction table, whereas on the left side, you're seeing the data that's been normalized across. But I think it's more interesting to see it if we take a look at it in context of answering a couple of questions. So if we, if we wanna answer the question, what are our best and worst selling products? So um, I wanna take a look at uh, our product name and our, where's my quantity sold? Jeez, I was just staring at it. Uh, quantity sold, there we go. All right, so pretty simple. I can sort and filter that. So I see five line items here. It's given me an answer on that. Let's pop into with relationships and do that very same thing. So I'm, all I'm going to do is just replicate what I just did. So quantity sold and product name. Okay, interesting. Different answer, same data set. 
So what's, what's happening? Well, there's, there's a couple of things that stand out. One is chocolate bar is here and we don't see it over here. Chocolate bar even has some sales on it and it's not showing up over here. So if I go back to my data source, uh, I can figure out why that is. Um, there, the, the default joins that are being done uh, are inner joins. And so if I take a look at the transaction uh, connecting to the customer, uh, sorry, hold on. First, I wanna take a look at the, uh, the join here. Uh, right now, it is not including all of the products that are not on transactions, okay? So if I make that a right join, and then it is also not including transactions where there is not a customer ID identified, where the data is not complete. So I'm going to make that a left join. Now I'm going to go back to my data and voila, I'm seeing the very same results in relationships in 2020.2. The point here is that you could still get to the right answer previous to relationships, but relationships, by just dragging in the tables into that data model, it knew the joins that needed to be made in order to do this analysis. Okay, so that's on the join side. The second thing I wanna show you is on aggregations. I wanna show you a, a very similar sort of approach, which is I'm gonna pull product name, uh, and I, what I wanna look at in this case is a calculated field that I made. Uh, and that all that's doing is subtracting unit cost from unit price. Okay, so if I pull the contribution margin into, let's just put it in text, uh, and let's just make that a currency here for a minute so that we're, makes sense what we're looking at. Okay, so I can see contribution uh, margin per product, calculated field, fine. Um, let's go ahead and with the same uh, calculation, uh, let's, let's go ahead and pull that in over here. So we'll do the same. This is with the relationships. Uh, and, you know, mostly looks the same. 325, 125 going down the list. Interesting. Juice. A duck, buck 75 versus 350. I see a couple of them that seem to be doubled up here. Okay, so for those of you in the audience that do write level of detail calculations, you're recognizing this is an aggregation problem. Uh, and actually, if I go into without relationships and I go edit uh, that calculation, I better check my time here. Okay, I think I'm doing all right. So if I edit that calculation, uh, oh boy, we're going to see how well I do. Um, <laughs> I didn't think about this part of the detail. Uh, uh, fixed on product name, right? Okay, yes, I am actually typing level of detail calculations in a demo in front of apparently several hundred people. Uh, okay, so, all right, calculations valid, and I'm gonna cheat, and I'm just gonna copy that same thing over here so that we get the right level of detail happening for that aggregation. All right, calculations valid, and Voila, it looks like the dollar ten, the three seventy-five, the dollar seventy-five and the three fifty, those are the same now. Okay, so I fixed the problem, right, in the old way. But again, I'm gonna go back to it. All I did in the data source with the relationships is drug these tables in. It did that level of detail calculation. It did those smart joins based on that data set. So just imagine, and by the way, just gonna go back to the slides now, by the way, um, the, some of the things that don't stand out other than those uh, smart calculations that we're talking about, play here. Um, other than the smart aggregations and, and essentially the contextual joins that are going on, the other thing that happens is it's a very flexible and performant data source. So it is, it is doing the joins in real time uh, it, is, uh, it is actually counting the rows, for example, in real time. It's doing all that, and it's, as a result, it's more performant, uh, and it's a heck of a lot easier to manage your data sets. One of the things that people end up doing is they create a bunch of different data models so that they can normalize the data in different ways, and this allows you to have actually less data sources, maintain less data sources, and have it be closer to your underlying data. So I, after Chantilly's 
presentation about looking at all of the interesting ways to visualize data, I thought I would dazzle you with underlying data model. I, do you feel dazzled? Do you, or was that, was that as great as I'm, I'm feeling right now? I see some smiles at least. Um, but I, the reason I'm bringing it out is because I think it's a really powerful, important thing. And there's some just fundamentally underlying, in fact, we're redoing a bunch of the free videos right now and some of the help documentation because it really changed uh, some of the fundamental underlying uh, dynamics of how Tableau works. Okay, so next, what's coming? Well, um, first, uh, 2020.3 is coming. Uh, in fact, we just put a beta out on it. Uh, if you're not part of the pre-release program, you can go and sign up for that. Uh, and one of the ways that I'm going to do this to show you what's coming is uh, I'm going to show you how you can self-serve on this information because my team does a fantastic job on this coming soon page. And so this coming soon page is really cool. This is, we're looking at uh, 2020.3. And so you can come up here and you can click to your heart's content uh, that, you know, we've gone through, we've done a really tight summary of what that thing's going to do. Uh, oftentimes we'll show an image or even a video or an animated uh, GIF or GIF here to sort of show, show it in action so you can really see uh, that capability jumping out. Uh, so a couple that I would focus on, uh, write to database. If you're using Tableau Prep, you know that you've been able to export in CSV uh, or Hyper. Uh, you will now be able to export to databases. There's a number of reasons that people want to do that. Audit reasons, they want to keep it in a highly performant uh, database. Uh, they want to be able to use different tools with it, data science tools as an example. And so that is coming and that has been a very strong requested feature. Excited to, to see that one coming. Uh, another one, okay, this might only, uh, might only apply to part of the world, I recognize, but SAP, We've been cranking pretty hard on that. SAP HANA is an important data source in a lot of organizations. Uh, and we have over each release, you've seen increasing SAP capabilities. This one will bring table functions, which is essentially stored procedures in, in, uh, in SAP HANA. But it also comes with an official certification of Tableau with SAP. And so all of you that have SAP data sources, uh, get ready, get excited. We're gonna keep jamming on that. Uh, another one here, uh, so we'll keep going on geospatial. So I want to point out the fact that there's this spatial file union. If you're doing geographic stuff, if you're not, if you don't, you probably look at that and say, I don't even know why that matters. If you are, then you're like, okay, I've been asking for that. So uh, fantastic. Uh, we will, uh, hold on. I, there was a couple more I wanted to hit here. Uh, I wanted to hit, oh. All right, I'm gonna keep rolling because I'm not seeing some of the things that I remembered that I wanted to talk about. Uh, subscription run on extract refresh. Man, I'm just in the guts right now. Everybody's saying like, hey, talk about visual analytics here, Mark. But these are like some of the, the core things that people want, especially when they're really operationalizing analytics in their organization, right? Essentially being able to kick off a subscription when your extract gets refreshed. Right, so a super big request, <laughs> requested feature seems simple enough. Um, one of the things, uh, oh, here it is, in, all right, it's, it's amazing how long this has been in the list, and we're talking about a pretty straightforward thing. You can do calcs with the in operator now. So you can uh, base your calculation result on uh, being in a comma separated list, uh, being in a set, uh, so being able to return your result in calculations based on using that in. Um, okay, so I think that's a bunch of the ones I wanted to sort of call out as high points in 2020.3, things to sort of focus on. And I'm just going to finish here and then ha happy to answer any questions. Just, uh, oops, sorry, let's flip it back to the slide, which is just a very simple slide. But um, this kind of frames how we're going to keep going. Uh, you, you're seeing the pace that we're launching with new things. And, you know, it, I, I think more important than saying, whoa, here's the big new thing that nobody ever thought of before, right? Uh, continuing to crank on these key areas of data management, 
uh, of getting to everywhere and continuing to support the deployment models that we support today. So you can get to it whatever you want, whether it's mobile, whether it's in the browser, whether you want to deploy in cloud or on premises, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then being able to serve different user types. Uh, Tableau, you know, the, the heart of Tableau is with the analyst community for sure, right? But increasingly doing things to make it more consumable and reachable for exec the executive office all the way to the business user that's, you know, being served by, by um, great analysis. And so um, that's a, a healthy part of our, of our, um, our roadmap, you've seen us do things like natural language, uh, it, some of the export to PowerPoint and PDF, and those things are really about being able to serve a broader and broader audience. Um, so that's that's a little bit about where our kind of investment investment areas are from a product strategy perspective. And I'm gonna stop the slide presentation and stop my screen sharing. Oops, not that this and I'm going to come back because I haven't been able to watch the Q&A during this time. So Aaron, maybe you can help me um, wrap on questions. Perfect. So the first one is how do you set up the data source using the relationship model instead of the join? I can barely hear you, but I did hear that, which is, um, that's funny. I do that all the time. It's up instead of down. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, how do you set up the data model if with relationships instead of joins? Correct. Yeah, so um, it, it will recognize several uh, data models, typical data schemes in, in, uh, in data warehouses that we find today, and we continue to expand that schema support. Um, but just to put a fine point on it, the way I created what we were looking at in Tableau uh, there was I just drug, I, I uh, connected to that Excel file uh, and I just drug the tables in. It was creating the relationships, the joins uh, uh, between those tables and the underlying, um, it was figuring out the calculations and things that it needed to be prepared to do as a result of that. So it was simply dragging and dropping in that case. I don't mean to say that's gonna be the case if you have more advanced uh, data sources, but I just wanted to answer that specifically with that data that we were looking at. Perfect, and that kind of feeds into our next question. Do the column names of the tables have to be specifically named a set of naming rules in order for the automatic join to happen in the relationship model? Yeah, it uses a lot of the rules that we've typically used. So when I created the, the relationships in the, um, it, it's schema aware, and that's why I was making the point about the schemas before. Um, but you can break it and there are considerations there, uh, just like there are today in Tableau. When you drag a table in, it will attempt to make a join on what it thinks the connection is. You can override that. In fact, one of the things that we didn't look at is, is that there's a, there's a bunch of uh, ordinality and things that you can get into the detail on in relationships. Um, you can open up um, you know, dialogue boxes in the product there and refine specifically how things are connecting, not just on the, the field and the name that they're connecting on, but on the characteristics of how they're connecting. And so there's a, it's both things. It's, there's a default behavior and you can do things to, um, to specify uh, more specifically if you've got a little bit more advanced uh, capability. Perfect. And then how will existing dashboards transition to the new relationship model when upgrading? Uh, so we really thought of you just like, uh, uh, I think that's a, um, I came to Tableau three years ago. I was really impressed. Now, of course, this group is going to light up the Q and a right now with examples where we failed on this, but I was, I'm really impressed with how Tableau thinks about kind of upgrade and things that break. And I can think of really major technology shifts that, that, um, I I'm just going to say that maybe they weren't perfectly smooth, but they were a lot smoother. And it's a part of the psyche of our Tableau development team. And so um, the, uh, shoot, I'm not going to take the time to show it. You, you, if you load uh, uh, existing uh, Twibix, let's say, uh, into Tableau, even with the new relationships, it, your existing, your classic, there's still a place in there where the joins that you've done them, they just stay exactly the same. So you have to do a conscious act actually to move it to using relationships rather than the existing data model that it's done. Um, but we, but the important part 
and for different data sources, that is going to be harder than others. But the important thing is, is that we haven't broken that. You won't upgrade and all of a sudden everything that you've done hasn't stopped working. It still works exactly the same in there. Perfect. And then the last one is any major updates to catalog coming soon? I know one of them is you're able to tag external assets in the Tableau catalog, but are there any additional? Yeah, um, boy. Okay, good question because I don't have the answer at the top of my head. But I, so I'm going to use my cheat sheet that I just shared with you guys because I, basically on uh, on prep, and on uh, conductor, uh, on these products, it's what you'll find in our roadmap is like a steady stream of updates. Uh, okay, Tableau coming soon. Uh, in, in each one, PrEP has been a really good example. In fact, um, it, it's been on an even more frequent uh, uh, release schedule than quarterly. Um, so it's been flying. What, maybe Can you ask me the next question? I'll come back to that and answer that in just a second here. I believe that is our last one. Oh, just kidding. Will there be a continuous subscription approach rather than a current version approach like Microsoft 365? Um, so subscription can be taken at times to mean a way that you buy and it can be taken at times as a way that you, uh, you know, kind of the product that you use. I'm going to answer both of those. So uh, Tableau today provides a subscription model to buy. In fact, it's one of the reasons that we've really accelerated our innovation and delivered on a more frequent basis. Um, to, to sort of deliver value fast for people that are buying in a subscription way. And most of our business, uh, you can see this publicly, most of our business is, has changed to that model of acquisition. The second uh, part of the question uh, that I could answer is in terms of delivery of the technology. And we, uh, we in fact do this today with Tableau Online. Uh, and so if you use uh, Tableau Online or another good example is Tableau Public, uh, where um, we upgrade it in place. So it's, it's not that people are all using a different backend uh, version of Tableau Online when they're a Tableau Online customer. When we upgrade it, we upgrade everybody. Uh, and uh, one of the advantages of that is you have the new stuff available to you immediately, um, including at the server level. Uh, which is, is, is uh, where a lot of innovation is coming these days as well uh, to the desktop. And so uh, that is an advantage to that model. Now, to effectively pull that off in an on-premises environment where somebody's running Tableau Server, it means the people that are running Tableau Server are having to do those upgrades on a super frequent basis. Um, and, uh, and that works for some organizations and we see, you know, some organizations absolutely keep on top of that and they find that very valuable. And there are others that might have more constraints and they might upgrade every six months, maybe every two releases or, or, or uh, even less frequently in some cases. So, uh, and that can depend on things like IT rules and the rest of it. So if you have a Tableau online account and you're a subscriber to that, you're going to see it in a very similar way. Uh, as the question and some of the other products that are provided in that way. That, that is the model. It's a bit of a long answer, but I hope I, I, uh, I hit on the, the main question. Definitely. So at this time, we'll open it up to the last remaining questions. If you have any, feel free to put it into the Q&A and we'll open it up. Um, if not, we'll hand it over to Steve to talk about our next event and close us out. Am I the only one that doesn't hear Steve? <laughs> I think you're still on mute, Steve. Uh, oh, there you are. I was on like double, <laughs> double triple mute. Um, <laughs> and it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't appear that anything else is coming through the interweb. So I'll, uh, I'll just say a big thank you to uh, Chantilly. And, it, and, I, and I think this, this session, not unlike other sessions, really highlights the uh, I mean, the Tableau community, the kindness, the generosity of folks in that community uh, to really keep giving back. Really excited. I think that was fantastic discussion, fantastic, uh, fantastic content. And we are, um, have already, I know we made this promise to you, and, and we've been challenged at times to keep it of announcing the next Columbus Tableau user group 
at the current Columbus Tableau user group meeting. And so we are set for July 30th, and we'll send this out as soon as it becomes official. We literally were just buttoning it up right before this meeting. So July 30th from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. will be a, be a thematic Tableau user group focusing on Tableau in higher ed, the teaching of Tableau, the preparation of folks to use Tableau. Maybe a bit blunt, but I think that, that captures it, doesn't it, Aaron? We'll, we'll be featuring uh, Shu Schiller, who I think I saw is on the webinar from Wright State University, along with Jeremy Paytas, um, who works at Highland and is an adjunct at, uh, I believe it's Wallace Baldwin. I say that very well, but Wallace Baldwin University. So excited about that. Mark your calendars. Get ready for an exciting event. And in addition, one, one closing remark, and this is something uh, – in terms of that idea of our role, me and Aaron, Matt Rust, and working with Derek in terms of our role in serving the Tableau community, um, one thing we think is important and we're committed to is trying to give you the best programs possible, the best content possible, providing a diversity of speakers, content, ideas all around the Tableau community. And uh, this was brought up by Josh Smith, so we, I really appreciate his um, feedback and communication with the group. As one recommendation was how can we open up the lines of communication between the community and the leadership team? It's, it's easy to say that, but if the conversations are mainly happening with me and Aaron and Matt and a small group of other folks, maybe we aren't, you know, we're really not seeing the whole, the bigger picture. So, so one thing we're committed to do over this, this month is open those lines of communication. So I hope, hope you all are on our LinkedIn page. Um, clearly we have your e email addresses by registering for this event, but we want to reach out and first survey you ideas that we can to improving, right? This is the programs we provide, whether it's speakers you'd like to see, content you'd like to see, but also providing access for you to reach out to us to, to even do that a little more intimately one-on-one. -on -one. And, 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 you know, maybe you want to present, maybe you have ideas about content, but again, just increasing that equity of access into the leadership team, ultimately for us to do the best job we can in serving you and the Tableau community. So we'll, we'll take that, I mean, and I don't mean to be light with it, we'll definitely take that as an action item. So look for communication from us coming soon. Hey, and with Steve. That, Hey, Steve, yeah. can I tell you, first of all, I'm so impressed that you guys are keeping up the regular cadence. I, I think that's really valuable for, for the sort of the richness of the community. And what we see from mm -hmm. you all is, is just awesome. Um, second, there's some real rock stars in your community. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, having Chantilly come and present just adds even more to the aura of that. So what, what you all are doing is, is really meaningful. Uh, and, and we feel the impact of that. Uh, and that's why it's a bummer not to be able to sit and see people face to face and say, thank you for the energy, you know, thank you for the, the commitment, thank you for pushing us, right? But the, I, and, mm -hmm. and just also how unique or, or how uh, special what you've created there is. Uh, to jump on and see a couple hundred people is just fabulous. So um, thanks for the hard work and thanks for the great community. Yeah, and thank you. Mark, Chantilly, Aaron, the rest of the team, thank you to the community. Thanks for your participation and look forward to uh, hearing from you between now and our uh, next event. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. All right. Take care, everyone. See ya.